So in this video, we're going to look, solve some more problems, um, problems involving thermodynamic potentials and heat engines. So the first one I'm going to look at is um, the synthesis of ammonia, which is this stuff here, uh, down here, um, from nitrogen and hydrogen, all them, all them are gases. Okay, and we're asked uh, to predict whether the following reaction for the synthesis of, uh, of ammonia is still spontaneous at 500 degrees C. Okay, so um, what information are we given? We're given that the enthalpy change is minus 92 kilojoules per mole, and the entropy change is minus 198 or 199 joule kelvin per mole. Okay, so um, the appropriate potential here uh, is the Gibbs free energy. Okay, and why is that? Well, because we're assuming uh, that everything is minimized uh, at constant T and constant P. Okay, that's what we're assuming. It's uh, we're assuming that the reaction occurs at constant pressure and constant temperature. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, have a look at this. Okay, here's our reaction. Um, now, what you see from our stuff here is the data tells us that the entropy change is negative. Okay, um, that implies there is less disorder in the products. Now, that's not too surprising because if you look at this, we've got nitrogen and three hydrogens. Uh, getting married to make um, two ammonia molecules. So basically the nitrogen and hydrogen are getting together uh, and now they're tied together so they have much less freedom. And so that's not surprising that delta S is actually negative. Um, also delta H is negative uh, and delta H as we've seen before is a measure of how much heat is absorbed by the system. Okay, uh, And we'll prove it again that you know H is equal to U plus PV therefore delta H is delta U plus PDV because we've got a constant pressure here which is uh, dq minus pdv because we're not getting doing any work uh, plus pdv uh, which is dq okay these these cancel out okay um, so um sorry i said before we're not doing any work we are doing work because um there's a there is a p there okay but the pdv terms cancel out and you just get dq so h measures um how much heat is absorbed by the system now in this case h is negative, so this system gives out heat, so it's exothermic, okay, this particular reaction. How do we get G? Okay, well, we're given uh, H and S, and from that you can get G, or delta the change in these things. So G is A plus PV, H is U plus PV, uh, and A is U minus TS, so if you put all those together, you'll find G is H minus TS, and delta G, therefore, is delta H, minus TDS, of course temperature is a constant here, so you don't have any delta T. Um, so we can actually figure out what delta G is. We can we know delta H, which is there, going to multiply by a thousand. We know what delta S is, it's that, it's joules per Kelvin per mole. Um, in fact, we probably need to go back here and correct this. This should be Kelvin to minus one there, okay? Um, and multiplying by the temperature in Kelvin, and that gives us delta G. Okay, so what do we know about delta G? It's positive. That's the only thing we really care about. Um, and that means the reaction will not proceed because by proceeding in this reaction, uh, you actually increase delta G, increase G for the whole system. And that's not what we want. Nature wants to decrease G, okay, for these kind of conditions. Uh, so it's not going to proceed this reaction at 500 degrees. Can we make it go? Can, is, is there a temperature at which it will start to go? Well, because delta S is less than zero and delta G is delta H minus T delta S, the hotter things get, the more positive delta G gets. Okay? So the reaction becomes more and more unlikely at higher temperatures. Now, delta H is, of course, negative. Where's delta H there? Delta H is that. So it's negative. So delta H favours the reaction, but unfortunately, uh, minus T delta S does not. Uh, and T here acts as an amplifier for enthalpy, entropy changes. So, you know, if you have a little bit of entropy change, if you multiply the temperature by a, a lot, that becomes important because, it's model, because the, the important thing is T times delta S, not just T. So the hotter things are, the more the entropy dominates. And in this reaction, entropy decreases. So any increase in temperature will stop it happening, so tend to prevent it happening, okay? But we can cool it down um, enough so that it will proceed. So if we solve to delta G equals zero, uh, we find that occurs at a temperature of 
Um, 460 degrees, degrees Kelvin, which is 109 degrees C. Okay, so you can make this reaction go if it's cold enough. Okay. Um, however, this reaction is a very famous reaction because it's the one that makes ammonia. Ammonia is an important industrial product and for fertilizers and cleaning agents and all kinds of stuff. Um, but um, the reaction does not go very well because it has to break a very stable triple bond in nitrogen. So if we go back here, where's our reaction? Uh, you can see it's got here, there's N2. So it's says N, do, 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 like that. That's the way a chemist would write it. And that bond there uh, is very stable and you have to be able to break it. So um, even though, in fact, um, if we look at uh, G versus, um, oh, this, is, this is a pathway, reaction pathway, if you like. And this is the um, this is the uh, reactants, and this is the products. Now, of course, this is out of equilibrium, so you can't really uh, you can't really do this kind of kind of graph. But I'm going to do it anyway. There's reactants here, there's some sort of minimum. Down here's the products, with some sort of minimum. But in between, there's a, a bump you have to go over. Okay, and the catalyst is needed to overcome this bump. Okay. Um, so the mere fact that there's a delta G which is negative, which is great, the reaction will proceed. It may well proceed, but it might take you know 400 millennia to, to actually work uh, and to get any any reasonable uh, outcome, any reasonable amount of product. And so um, it needs a catalyst, um, and it turns out you also also high pressure helps in this particular case. Um, and the first person to succeed in doing this reaction properly, to make it go properly, was uh, Fritz Haber. Uh, a German chemist, because Germany in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was really a top place for chemistry. So he did this in 1909, um, and he won the Nobel Prize for it in 1918. Okay, um, So ammonia was used to make fertilizer and explosives, and Harbour's work probably prolonged World War I by about two years, because um, Germany had no access to Chilean mineral supplies of ammonia, uh, and... Um, Therefore, they had to make their own. So his, his work probably you know, killed a lot of people just by prolonging the war. Um, he's also known as the father of chemical warfare because he helped develop chlorine gas as a weapon. So um, you know, um, this person's contribution to the world um, you know, could be considered to be very positive because he helped make this fertilizer, but uh, other ways it might not be. All right, so that's, uh, that's an example of thermodynamic potentials in use. Let's do another heat problem, uh, another heat engine problem. Now, um, here's, a, here's a picture of the Chernobyl um, control center, control panels. And um, nuclear reactors, and indeed fossil fuel plants, they're always situated near lakes or rivers or oceans, some big bit of water, okay? Um, that's why Fukushima was located on the coast, and that's the reason why it, uh, it well, well, went Everything went pear-shaped when it got hit by a tsunami, okay? The reason why you need a big body of water is you have to better dump your waste heat, okay? Because it can't, remember, a Carnot cycle or any sort of heat engine of that kind needs somewhere to actually have the heat uh, expelled to, okay? And a big body of water, because water has so much um, heat capacity, the water's a really good way of doing that. Okay, so suppose we have a nuclear plant which produces 750 megawatts. That's the actual power output of the plant. Okay, you, you, you know, you can, you can run 751 megawatt toasters from such a plant, okay? The temperature of the reactor is 586 degrees Kelvin, and the river temperature, which is pretty constant, is gonna be 293 degrees Kelvin, okay, so 20 degrees, okay? What is the maximum thermal efficiency of the plant and how much heat must be discarded in the river, okay? So you read the words maximum thermal efficiency and you automatically think of Carnot cycle because that's the best you could possibly do. So let's use the Carnot cycle. When in doubt, use Carnot, okay? So um, our efficiency is one minus the temperature of the sink, the cold source, minus the temperature of, uh, divided by the temperature of the hot source, 293 divided by 506, which turns out to be 0.5, okay? And this means that half of the heat supplied by fission actually appears as work. The rest is dumped in the river. Okay. So how much of this is dumped in the river? Well, 750 watts, megawatts is dumped in the river because um, the amount of work is 750 megawatts. The amount, of, um, the amount you actually burn, the amount of fuel you burn, the amount of heat produced 
is actually twice this. Okay, so what happens in this situation is you've got a 750 watts of, uh, let's, let's, let's draw a picture here. Here's our, here's our river, here's our reactor, uh, and here's our engine, which produces here um, 750, right? Um, and we know that's the work done, or the work or the power, work in inverted commas, okay? Work times, work divided by time. Um, and we know efficiency is equal to work output divided by Q input. So this is the Q that comes from the reactor here, the Q input, okay, which is a half. So we must have uh, twice as much, um, uh, the, the Q must be, Q input is 2W. So in fact, that means that the input heat here must be 1,500 megawatts the input power, uh, 750 goes this way and 750 gets dumped in the lake. So half of our uh, stuff gets dumped in the lake. Okay, so uh, as I said, down, say down here, a one megawatt power station actually produces one megajoule of energy per unit per second, but of course it burns a great deal more than this. It might burn two megajoules of energy per, per second. Okay, so this unfortunately creates a lot of so-called thermal pollution. So dumping lots of heats in lakes is not a good idea um, because um, an increase in temperature of the lake for the water means less dissolved oxygen and hence some pretty sick fish. Okay, so you can't just keep heating up lakes willy-nilly and hope nothing's going to go wrong. Okay. Now, so this question asks, if the efficiency of the power plant is actually uh, only, this is the only, 60% of the maximum, how much power is dumped in the river and if the flow of the river, rate of river is 165 meters cubed per second, what is, what is the temperature increase? Okay, so let's do the first bit first, okay? So the efficiency now is only 60% of our 0.5, which is 0.3, and that's equal to W divided by Q from the hot source, the reactor, okay? So Q from the hot source must be equal to the work done, which is 750 megawatts, I'm putting everything in sort of power rather than energy, okay? Divided by 0.3, and that's 2,500 megawatts, um, which is actually uh, put out by the um, by the reactor. Okay, now um, seventy percent of that is dumped in the river because we only have an efficiency of thirty percent. So seventy percent of that, 0.7 times two thousand five hundred, is one thousand seven hundred fifty megawatts, which is continuously dumped in the river or the lake wherever, wherever it's being dumped. Okay, here's a, here's a river. Okay, so that's how much power is dumped in the in the in the lake or in the river. So how do we figure out what the temperature increase of the river water actually is. Okay, now uh, we do that by the following th uh, thing. We have 165 meters cubed per second flowing down the river. So we've got 165 meters cubed per second of water flowing in the river. Okay, and each second that means we have um, 165 times um, a thousand kilograms of water uh, flowing past, okay, because one meter cubed weighs a thousand kilograms, okay, uh, and we also know that in order to increase the um, the temperature of the of the water, we have uh, heat capacity, which Cp, which is 4,180 uh, joules per kilogram per kelvin, okay, which is this thing, okay, so therefore, if we want to increase the temperature of the water by, uh, by of this much water by um, by one degree, for instance, we have to multiply that by the amount of water we have, uh, and that will tell us how many joules we need. Okay. Now, in more generally, if we want to have um, if we have a certain amount of power going through the thing, uh, and uh, this is the flow rate in terms of mass, this is the heat capacity, um, you can derive fairly easily of yourself that this will actually be the temperature increase, okay? Go back and look at how much per second flows, uh, convert everything from energy to per second, um, and get the power, and you will find out the increase in um, temperature of the water is 2.54 Kelvin. You should try and that yourself, okay? And you'll find it's that that's the answer. 2.54 Kelvin is the increase, in, which is quite a lot, okay? All right, so the final problem we'll do is a gas problem. Uh, much simpler one, in fact, but it's 
um, good to do. Um, so we have basically gas in a cylinder, as usual. Um, and what we're going to do is, uh, there's a, here there's a massless, frictionless piston. The gas is at temperature T. It's kept constant. Uh, how much work needs to be done in order to increase the volume by a factor of nu? So we're going to take this, it's like a syringe in some sense. We're going to try and pull this back and increase this volume from V to nu times V. Okay? Um, and we're going to assume that the external side of the piston, this, this thing is open to the atmosphere. This, this thing's open to the atmosphere, but it's, it's closed by the piston. Okay, so the atmospheric pressure is pushing down here. Okay, so we'll let the cylinder have area S and X be the length of this the cylinder here. Um, and initially the pressure on the gas must be equal to the atmospheric pressure because for this thing to be in equilibrium, you must have the pressure here and the pressure on that side being equal. Otherwise, it'll move. So we know that pressure times, um, uh, times the area times X the, uh, which is the length of the cylinder and the piston, must equal the pressure, atmospheric pressure times S times X, uh, and that must equal um, R times T, okay, for this thing to, to work out. So X naught, the, si the original size, um, must be equal to RT divided by pressure, atmospheric pressure times S, because we actually have one mole, so you might want to wonder, where's the N gone? Well, N here is one, so there's only one mole. So that's, that, that says... Um, Pressure times volume equals nRT, and N is 1. So, okay, that's where that comes from. So that tells us the height of our initial height of our, our cylinder, where the, where, the, where the actual piston is. Okay, now, of course, we're going to start pulling up on this in order to increase the volume. And, of course, it's like pulling up on a, on a syringe where you put your thumb over the very end of it and you're pulling up on it. Um, how much um, work do you need to do? Um, well, um, in order to do that amount of work, uh, we need to uh, apply a force, and that force is P minus PA times S. So the, we've got our cylinder here, we've got our atmospheric pressure PA, we've got a pressure here in the cylinder P, um, and we must apply an extra force here to lift it up because P is going to, it starts off at equal to PA, but then it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, uh, and when we do that, minus P, P minus PA times S, we get uh, that, which is this PV equals nRT, plus this bit, which is a constant. Okay, that's the force. The work we do is uh, expanding x from x naught to nu x naught, given what nu is here. Um, and so the work is the integral of that, uh, and you can do the integrals uh, and fairly trivially, and you get that as the work you need to do, which is minus RT log nu on nu minus 1. Okay, and that's how much work needs to be done. That's a fairly fairly straightforward problem because it's 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 at um, it's at uh, uh, uniform temperature, constant temperature, isothermal. Okay, actually we're gonna fin finish off with one more problem, um, and that one is again calculating entropy. And this is this is a very important problem. This one because it shows you how to cal calculate entropy changes and what happens for reversible and irreversible processes. Again, the mathematics is very trivial, but the thinking is, is not. Okay, so we have one kilogram of water at, you know, basically ice temperature almost, 273 degrees Kelvin, is brought into contact with a heat reservoir at almost 100 degrees. Okay, and when the water has reached 373 degrees Kelvin, what is the entropy change of the water? So basically we've got this water here, and we bring it into contact with an enormous heat reservoir, which sounds like, sounds like this, um, and it, it heats up, okay? So we ask, what, the, what is the entropy change of the water? What's the entropy change of the heat reservoir of the whole universe? Okay. Now, remember, when you're calculating entropy changes, the only way you really have, at least in thermodynamics, to calculate entropy changes is to take it from its initial state to its final state by a reversible process. Anyone you like, um, just to choose ones that are simple is best. Um, and we're going to choose one here, which is fairly, really as simple as we possibly could have, which is we're going to calculate the entropy change of water uh, via a reversible path. And the simplest one is to go from this temperature to this temperature by putting our water here 
into contact with a whole series of heat, res heat reservoirs um, uh, at different temperatures, temperatures slightly hotter than the one that this one, than the actual reservoir we have, uh, sorry, slightly hotter than the water, uh, and gradually just put into contact with an infinite number of heat reservoirs, all of them slightly hotter. Now, you'll see, of course, here that this has absolutely nothing to do with the actual experiment. The actual experiment is you put the water here, surround it with a heat bath, okay? The heat, the heat bath at constant temperature just, um, just shoves heat into this thing, and it's all irreversible, okay? The actual, to calculate the actual entropy change of this, we take an entirely different, completely imaginary process, which we're not even doing in the lab, but just thinking about, um, where we take our, our, our um, bit of water and we put into contact, if it's temperature's T, we put into contact with, the, with another bath at temperature T plus DT. And then we put it, uh, then we heat heats up a little bit to a temperature T prime, and then we put it into contact with a bath at temperature uh, T prime plus DT. Okay, and we keep doing this. That's our thought experiment. And that allows us to calculate the entropy. Okay, so um, as we say here, we put into contact with a reservoir which has uh, the temperature of the water plus some extra bit. Okay. Now, when we put it into contact with this, this reservoir, which is only infinitesimally hotter than the water, um, an amount of heat flows, and that amount of heat flow is dq equals m, the mass of water, times the heat capacity constant pressure, times dt. Okay? And therefore, the change in entropy of the water is just dq divided by the temperature of the water, which is mcp dt on t, because the temperature of the water on t are the same thing. Um, and then we can just calculate the entropy change of the water, which is just this, the integral of dq on t, okay, from 273 to 373. Uh, when you do that, you do the integral, you find out the answer is 1,307 joules um, per Kelvin. That's our, that's our increase, in temper, uh, increase in entropy of the water. Now, that's the increase of entropy of the water, and it doesn't matter how we got there, remember. So um, in this... In this particular experiment, the original experiment, uh, we just put it into contact with a heat reservoir and the heat just flows and you know irreversibly and it's, you know just heats up. Uh, in our thought experiment, we have needed an infinite series of reservoirs, but because entropy is a state function, what this means is that um, the entropy change we calculated has to be the same in both cases. So that's the entropy change of the water in any case you like. Okay, between two seventy three and three seventy three, that's what it always is: one thousand three hundred seven joules joule per kelvin. All right, so we're also asked for the entropy chains of the reservoir, okay? Now, um, that's also fairly simple because the reservoir has a constant temperature, and that temperature is um, 373, okay? And so, therefore, all we need to figure out is how much heat uh, is taken from the reservoir into the water uh, and, um, and divide that by the temperature of the reservoir, and we've got the entropy change. Okay, so um, how much heat is taken away? Well, the amount of heat that's taken away is the temperature, final temperature of the water minus initial temperature of the water times M times Cp for the, for the water, and that turns out to be some enormous number, 418600 joules. Okay, that's how much heat is given to the water. Uh, of course, by definition, that means that much heat is extracted from the reservoir. So delta Q for the reservoir is minus that. Uh, divided by the temperature of the reservoir gives us the entropy change of the reservoir. So, we've now got the entropy change of the reservoir, we've got the entropy change of the water, okay? Uh, and the entropy change of the universe, of course, must be equal to the sum of those two, because that's, that's the only thing that's in the universe, the water and the reservoir. And we add those two up and we get 185 joules per Kelvin, which is positive. And of course, it must be positive because it always has to be greater than or equal to zero since the entropy always increases you know, due to Clausius. We know, we know that. Okay, so um, that's how you do this problem. Now, again, calculationally, it's completely trivial, but you have to really think what's going on. Okay, to do this because we've got to make had to make up this thought thought experiment process where you you, you do an artificial uh, heating of the water gradually. Okay. All right. Um, now, uh, another question we can ask is, how much work have we missed out on? So we've got this, this damn thing where we, we just increase the entropy of the universe by 185 degrees, uh, 185 joules per Kelvin, okay? Now, um, 
On the other hand, this this system did not do any work. It's the laziest, you know, it's the worst heat engine in the world. It's, it's not even a heat engine. All it's done is conduct heat from a hot source to a cold source, and we've done no useful work. So we missed out on useful work, and this this change in entropy of the universe sort of tells us that. Okay, we missed out something here. So how much work could we have extracted from this system? Okay, now we could have made a heat a heat engine which starts. Uh, here's my reservoir. Here's my water. And I could have made a heat engine which takes heat out of the reservoir, dumps in the water, and does some work. Okay. Now, um, the only complication here is that as we do this, the, um, the water gradually heats up. Okay. So if we start dumping heat in the water, it's a finite amount of water, and it will gradually heat up uh, as, the, as the cycle goes on. Okay. So we have to account for that. In fact, what we need is a whole series of Carnot engines between the reservoir and the water, uh, with the hot temperature always being at the temperature of the reservoir, because that's constant, and the cold reservoir, the cold temperature being the water. So the cold, the cold reservoir, this is a, too many reservoirs in this question. Okay. So let's let the water temperature at some particular point be T, and when we dump a little tiny bit of heat into it, its temperature rises by dt. Okay. The amount of heat transferred by the engine is um, the heat change, the temperature change times M times Cp. Okay. And the efficiency of a Carnot engine using this cycle is going to be 1 minus T, the temperature of our water divided by T reservoir, which is the work done divided by uh, QH. Okay. And uh, QH plus QC must equal W by conservation of energy. Okay. So we have here the relationship between work and heat for our system. Okay. Uh, and when we've uh, done that, we can figure out, um, we also know how much heat is dumped into the reservoir, into the, sorry, into the water. And therefore, how much work is done by this system, there's a little bit of work put out here, when the water temperature increases by dt. So you just put all those things together uh, you should try that yourself, because I've gone through that really quickly. Uh, and so, in one little step where the water temperature increases by dt, this is how much work you've done. But we also know that the uh, efficiency is 1 minus T on T reservoir. So if we put all that into there, we find out the work done is this, in our little infinitesimal step. Uh, and therefore the work done for the whole, not whole cycle, but for the whole process of raising the water from 273 to 373 is the integral of that, which is that. And we do that, we find the answer is 68716 joules. That's how much um, work we could have generated here, and we didn't. Okay, so it's that, that last problem is a particularly um, good problem to look at, because again, we've looked at um, all kinds of entropy changes, how much work we've missed out on. It's, it's, this, this kind of problem has uh, just about um, everything in it as far as entropy change and heat engines goes. It's a really, really good problem. Okay, so um, 